Hi, everyone. You're watching ACT TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. It's been said that the role of police is essentially to protect capitalism. While there's much to unpack in the aftermath of ex-police officer Derek Chauvin's trial, where he was found guilty of murder in the death of George Floyd, I thought we'd speak to one of ACT TV's favorite recurring guests to discuss, in the wake of this trial, the intersection of policing and capitalism. Professor Richard Wolf, host of the widely popular program Economic Update, is joining us today. Then you come in. <laughs> Here you are. Okay. Hold on a second. And thank you for joining us, Professor Wolf. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so if people are watching this on YouTube in the future, I'm sure history has not forgotten that George Floyd was a black man murdered by an on-duty police officer who knelt with his full weight on Mr. Floyd's throat for over nine minutes. The incident was both watched and filmed by horrified bystanders, which in the end was crucial in bringing continuing police brutality uh, toward people of color, especially in our country, to light and bringing Officer Siobhan to justice as well. We are right now the day after the guilty verdict. Professor Wolf, can you give us your thoughts on the recent guilty verdict reached in this case? Well, I won't repeat what the press is full of, which is mostly the specific details of the verdict, of the trial, of the accusations, of the uh, presentations by the opposing lawyers and all of that. This is, of course, a tragic, horrible event in American history, made only worse by the fact that it has happened so often in our history for many, many decades. And so it is, for me, a social problem that keeps exploding in these particular individual acts. And my great fear is that it will continue to be seen as something about individuals, which it is, but not also about the social problems that produce these kinds of explosions. So for me, what I would like to talk about and what I would like your audience to think about are the social dimensions that produce these events. Every social movement, every social change in human history has been punctuated, has even come to light in people's minds through particular individual events or acts. If you only see the individual, the particulars of George Floyd, the particulars of Derek Chauvin, then you will lose, you will not understand the social dimensions. And why is that important? Because if we don't deal with those social dimensions, we're going to continue to have these horrible events as we have had them in the past. Uh, it's been said that the role of policing is to protect capitalism. Can you talk a little bit about what is meant by that and how this kind of all comes together, given where we are in late stage capitalism here in the United States? Yes, I think the, the phrase that the job of the police is to protect capitalism has always been true and follows from the very logic and organization of capitalism. Uh, let me briefly explain. Every capitalist enterprise in a capitalist system, factory, office, store, is organized in a way that ought to give you pause, that ought to make us think. Here's how it's organized in a way that leads right to the police. A very small number of people sitting at the top of every enterprise, or 99% of them, a very small group of people run the show. They're the board of directors in a corporation. They're the family that owns the bulk of the shares. It's the owner who started the business. Whoever it is, a tiny group of people arrayed over on the other side in every enterprise is a vast majority of people, employees. And we all know how this system works. The goal, the purpose, the drive of those who sit at the top is to maximize profits. We know that's the case because they tell us that 
in every newspaper and TV show and in every course taught in a business school uh, in a capitalist society. They are also taught that one of the ways you improve pro profitability is by controlling, limiting, or reducing your labor costs. That's a polite way of saying get more out of your workers, pay them less, or if you're really good, both of those at the same time. <laughs> All right, now th th this is a structure that means that those at the top are able to gather into their hands the profit. Everyone's work may help produce the profit, but only those at the top get it. And they use it, not surprisingly, in good part to enrich themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, and to build up the business. That's how the system works. But that creates winners and losers, those who see themselves falling further and further behind because the wealth of society, the profit, is gathered into the hands of a vel relatively small number. And now here comes the punchline. The relatively small number at the top, the directors, the major shareholders, the family that runs it, whoever they are, they're not stupid, they're smart people. They understand that they are minorities becoming richer and richer while the mass of people aren't. And that's a dangerous position to be in. They know that. They need protection. And, and they, they've done this wonderful thing where they convince the people that they need protection from each other and therefore... They get exactly. the people to pay through taxes to fund the police department that is basically in the role of protecting this higher echelon exactly. of, of people. But you can be Smart. sure you can be sure that the people at the top <clears throat> understand perfectly well that they need the police, and in the in an extreme, they'd pay the police if they can get the mass of people to pay. Well, even better, and they will try for that, and they have succeeded quite well. But the first thing that the police have to understand is that whatever services they provide to the citizens as a whole, and they provide some, they do stand at the intersection and make sure that uh, we all observe the red light and the green light. And all. They do socially useful things. That's always been used as the kind of cover so that we can discuss them in terms of the socially useful things in order not to have to face the horrible things they are also called upon to do. Do you think we could separate those two things out? Oh, there's a lot of calls to you know, they're, they're say defund the police, which really means move money from policing as a force to um, sustainable, sustaining our, our, our um, citizens to being more sustainable. Do you think that we could split those two roles? Absolutely. It's been done in other societies. It's even being done right now because other societies have a problem with their police for the same reason. It's not as severe in the United States, and we need to discuss why that's the case. But other societies that are capitalist have this problem too. And one of the things they discovered <clears throat> goes to your question of splitting it. And they've realized that when you throw the police at every kind of social issue, it's the police themselves that get confused about their roles. They get confused. Is this a time when I'm supposed to be the nice policeman who helps people across the street in a safe way, what we can call a socially useful function of the police? Or is this a time where I hit the worker over the head so he doesn't threaten the capitalist system, which enriches everybody but him? Okay. When the cops get confused, then they behave badly. They treat the old lady trying to get across the street as if she were some sort of danger and they get messed up. And what other societies have done, for example, is to begin to institute an arrangement where, for example, when the problem that arises is a domestic dispute, that's one of those euphemisms of, of abuse of spouse kind of situation, mm -hmm. that you don't send in the police first. 
They're not the appropriate. They're not trained for that. They don't understand that. And they get confused about what their role here is. Mm -hmm. You send in a social worker or a mental health counselor or somebody much better able. Only if they can't handle the situation do you then. This is already a beginning of understanding the separation of function. The problem is the folks at the top are so nervous about how vulnerable they are. And let's remember, they are. They are a small minority. We are the majority. No wonder they're scared. So they but want those people in the middle are kind of scared as well. They've been scared because they don't see their uh, plight as equal to people who are, say, struggling more. Absolutely. That's been one of the geniuses, if you like, evil genius, but the genius of the capitalist system to always put the working people against each other to frighten one part of the working class about the other part. And nothing is better uh, at doing that than to make one part of the working class better off and another part much worse off and then frighten those who are better off that they better behave properly or else they're going to sink into the condition of those that are worse off, make the worse off bitter at those that are better off for somehow at being part of the pro Meanwhile, those sitting at the top can do what I find particularly unpleasant, give lectures to the working class about being more loving to one another when you're the ones who've set up a situation that makes that not happen. Uh, arguing that <clears throat> in church on Sunday, we should all turn the other cheek and love our neighbors and all the rest of it, when you have organized a society that couldn't possibly live that morality that's a cruel, torturous kind of ethics uh, and not honorable. Let me give you a simple example. If over the decades, this country had used its wealth, <clears throat> sorry about my allergies. If, you, if this country had used its wealth to give to its African-American community, the jobs, the housing, the schooling, the medical care that it gave to white people in general, and not all white people, lots of difference among white people too. But if you had lifted up those at the bottom to give them hope and a chance at a decent life and a good job, many of the de tensions between these different groups would have disappeared. You wouldn't have had to call the police in because the African-American community wouldn't be as angry as they have every right to be given the way they've been treated for so long in this country. <clears throat> that would be understanding the social roots of our problems. It might solve them because what we have done, throwing police at our problems, it hasn't worked. That's why we're at this situation now. And you know, if it doesn't work over and over again, training the police and being more sensitive, stop. Asking the community to be more welcoming, stop. It doesn't work. And you have to learn from what doesn't work and try something that does. I mean, I don't think you can train people out of like racist <clears throat> hate. We have also have to, have to uh, look at the fact that slave patrols are the the root of policing in the United States is basically slave patrols. That and whatever happened in Boston, the very wealthy mm. people wanted to make sure their merchant ships weren't, right. um, you know, being overrun by starving people in the street who need food. You know, <laughs> this Absolutely. expectation that you can just keep people in dire straits and then right. and they should, due to morality, not steal your chickens. It just seems insane. Um, my question here, Professor Wolf, is if you could comment on, you know, your organization, Democracy at Work, encourages people to um, learn about, become part of, do whatever they can to to have democracy in the or you know, democracy in the workplace. Meaning, each person owns a share, each person has a voice, that kind of thing, down to every, you know, not just the people at the top, but down to every right. single right. worker, and therefore people are more. Um, engaged in the workplace. Uh, they have a sense of belonging. They have a sense of purpose, et cetera. Talk about if that kind of, um, if that kind of establishment were, were widespread, let's, let's go on and dream. There's 
50, 60 percent of workplaces in the United States are functioning this way, let's say. What effect would that have on sort of this stratification of society and the need for the police to protect the top one percent? Um I think a democratized workplace where everybody has one person, one vote, if that were the regime that governed our enterprises, then there wouldn't be a tiny group at the top who makes all the decisions. It would be democratic decisions, everybody having a say. And here's one thing I could assure you. If everybody had an equal voice, it would never happen that you would give a tiny minority of the people vast wealth and the rest of the folks unable to send their kids to college because it's too expensive. In other words, we would never have the kinds of inequality that capitalism is so usually uh, productive of. And if we didn't have a small group of people with inordinate wealth, then they wouldn't need police protection. You know, I can show it to you another way. Millions of people over the years have lived in small villages and small towns where the police are not a force like what we have here. And typically, when you look at it, it's because those communities do not have a structure of a few very wealthy people and everybody else uh, looking with envy at them. I think that's a key way to deal with the social roots of the problem. Here's another one. President Biden has announced that in September, the troops the United States sent to Afghanistan will finally be coming home after the longest war in American history. And because it was the longest war, the current estimate is it cost not only the lives of all the people killed, wounded, mentally wrecked, but $2 trillion, $2 trillion of wealth. If we had used that wealth instead of going to Afghanistan to really do something for the bottom half of the United States in terms of jobs, housing, schools, medical care, you would have transformed this country into a much less unequal society with much less in the way <clears throat> of social problems much less need for the police, then the defunding of the police wouldn't be taking away their money. It would be removing an institution we no longer need, which is good for everybody. And by the way, it's good for the police too, because you know the police cannot solve a social problem. They can repress the people protesting against it, but they cannot solve the problem. That's why it doesn't go away. We already have put an inordinate number of African Americans into our prisons. We have more people in prison than any other country per capita uh, in the world. It, it's outrageous, the repression that we have imposed, and it doesn't solve anything. It keeps costing us money. It's like that war in Afghanistan. By all accounts, the Taliban, our enemy over there, we were told, is more powerful and more entrenched now than it was 20 years ago when this began. There's well, been no winner yeah. here, but that you could have done something with that money that really helps the American people in the way that this war did not. Well, I, I was speaking on a separate <clears throat> podcast yesterday uh, about, about how War is really just a cover for a handout to the um, arms manufacturers. So in that in that way, the arms manufacturers made a ton of money off right. of this war. So it was a success in terms of capitalism's, you know, inter interconnection with militarism. It wasn't a success. Yes, I think that's true. I think that the, the only real winner in that war was the defense industry because they had continuous orders and for them it was a profitable venture. But for the people who died, the people who were wounded, the people whose, whose lives have been destroyed, and many in that country and many here in the United States in, in all kinds of ways, they were losers. And the political strength of the United States 
Afghanistan is not going to be a friend of the United States for a long time. Neither is Iraq. Those people are not going to forget. The rest of the world, the Muslim world, knows that the United States attacked for 20 years two Muslim countries. For the rest of the world, that is a much more powerful anti-Muslim behavior than anything, for example, that the Chinese are doing in that province, which, which is a Muslim province. And I'm not justifying or excusing what the Chinese are likely doing there. That's not the point. But the United States outraged over the oppression of Muslim people after a 20-year war on two Muslim countries, the rest of the world looks at this and shakes its head. <laughs> we could have done much, much better, not just for the American society in view of this kind of police catastrophe, but we would be much better viewed in the world and therefore much more secure in the world if we hadn't done what we did. So yeah, the only unambiguous winner here are the defense industries who produced profitably and sold it all to the government, which threw it into the winds and deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan. But for everybody else involved, a losing proposition. So <clears throat> people are celebrating over the first step toward justice in this particular case with Derek Chauvin and George Floyd. Um, I don't want to take away from the fact that this is a historic moment, um, but I do really so appreciate you talking about the structures that will continue to um, uh, to to embolden police, not not just the need for police and what police are standing for, but the brutality of of police, the structures that are that are um, in place there. I don't want to depress everyone after a big win, <laughs> but I think it's important that we discuss what we're discussing here. And um, to that end, we've discussed that even though we have Joe Biden and he's handing out money and things are looking a little better for the on the domestic front than they were under uh, President Fascist Trump. Um, our society is still edging closer to the collapse of capitalism every day. We've discussed this in past interviews. What can we expect to see as society edges closer to the collapse of capitalism in this area of policing? Does history have anything to teach us here? What are we looking at? Well, I don't mean to depress anyone, but if we're going to be honest with one another, which after all, is the point and purpose of, of this kind of conversation, then I would have to say that we are looking at a society that is torn apart already, as we know, we see it all the time. But here's a dimension you may not have thought of. There are two sides right now struggling to figure out how to handle a capitalism that is in decline. I know this is hard for Americans to get their hands around. If you want to see how hard it can be, take a look at Great Britain. It started its decline from the glory days of the British Empire a century ago. And they're still having trouble understanding that they're no longer what they were, that they are an economic system getting smaller they had to break away from Europe because they couldn't face that they were just a part of Europe. They had to be, and they played to that. And Boris Johnson is the Trump of that society, playing on all of that with theater, because the reality is that capitalism has always moved on when it was profitable. In the good days, capitalism rising, we're all on the ride up, and it's a good fun. It's like Detroit before 1970, as more and more cars were built, as more and more cars were exported. Detroit boomed, and it was a center for even African Americans to get good jobs in the auto plant. It was just wonderful. That's the ride up. But then it became more profitable for General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler to make cars somewhere else where they could pay workers less. So they left to Canada, to Mexico, and now to China and Brazil and so on. They left. The main paper industry was once the booming success of that state. 
Now it's a miserable dead industry because it left because it was profitable to leave. And where are the people with the profit going to make money now? To China, to India, to Brazil, and so on. It's very hard to be the downside. And when that happens, here's how the society splits. Some people face it and say, we've got to change our system because capitalism is no longer working for most of us. That's where I am. That's where I think the majority of the American people are already or close to getting. But then there is the other side, those who did real well on the upswing of capitalism, and they don't want to give up anything that they got. They're the ones who keep fighting for a system because it's profitable for them. And as the system goes down, they want to hold on to what they have. But in a declining system, if you don't give up your portion, you make the others have to give up even more as the system. And that suggests that they're going to be needing the police, not less than in the past, more. And yeah, this was an important case, and it does make a difference. I don't want to take away from it either. But if we don't see these larger dimensions we're going to be very sorry that we missed perhaps a chance to draw the large social lesson from this case. And then unfortunately, we will have all too many more cases. As we already know, the young man, the, the, the young boy in Chicago, I mean, it keeps on going. And we don't even see or hear uh, the media uh, when they aren't in the glare of publicity. And there are plenty who aren't. So for me, again, dealing with the social issues. And one last word I do want to express, even in this moment, a certain empathy, a certain sympathy for the police. Many of the young men and women who go into the police come out of that notion, I'm going to be a helpful person in the community, that other function that police or guardians can, can serve. And then they discover, often traumatizing their own lives, that they're also the hired guns for the folks at the top. And that does a number on their heads, and that's why some of them behave the way we see them. They also behave. have very high suicide rates. Yes. And we should be understand. Nobody should be put in that position. Individual policemen cannot cope with a social system breaking down. It's absurd and unfair to them, too, to put them in that situation. They are suffering even as they make others suffer because of what they're demanding officers tell them to do. And so that, that too can play a role because if there were some understanding of what the police are being put, put to do, there might be a lot more sympathy among the police too who understand the danger to them of the situation this system puts them into. Professor Richard Wolf, it's always a pleasure to have you on and hear your perspective. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much, Juliana. I appreciate these conversations very much. Don't, for, don't miss Professor Wolf's economic update, which comes out every week on Facebook. Or No, you're on YouTube. I'm sorry, just like we right. are. Yes. <laughs> Democracy at Work is the website you can find Professor Wolf's work at, and you are on Twitter at Prof. Wolf. Thanks again for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Juliana. You're watching Act TV. Please subscribe to our channel. We're growing and we need your help. Thank you.